Take your Bible. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 2, if you would. 1 Peter chapter 2. I have it on the screen. I want you to see it in your Bible. Um, I've got something I'm going to put up on the screen here in a little bit after we read the, the text. And I'm going to be asking you some questions tonight and uh, just look forward to your response. Uh, in fact, I'll just go ahead and ask you tonight, how many of you have ever visited or been part of a church that you, it, it, you, you either knew it when you got there or you realized later on that this church was probably way off course as far as what a church should be like. Has anybody ever been in that, anything like that before? Matthew, if you say this church, I'm going to step back there and I'm going to pop you. All right? I remember my mother, uh, she's got a couple friends she goes to church with down here, down south here, and, and uh, they like to go out to Lake of the Ozarks every now and then, and they was out there one weekend, and, and they looked around for a church, and they found a, I guess it was a Baptist church or something like that, and they said, well, we're Baptists, we'll go to that one. And my mom said that they got in that church, and from the moment they walked in the door, nothing seemed right. And she said the longer they did, kind of, they had to walk through the bookstore and the coffee shop, walk through the gift shop, walked into the sanctuary, and the longer they stood there, the worse it got. And they were just going, they're just looking around, and they're just you know, seeing everybody coming in with their coffee cups and their danishes or whatever, you know. And the, the music started up and they heard that music and they both, they all three looked at each other and they said, we need to get out of this place. And they left. And mom was telling me about that. And I said, mom, you got a spirit in you that was contrary to the spirit that is in that church. And the spirit that was in that church was growling. And, and, just that, listen, that spirit in that church wanted you out of there more than you wanted out of there. And they recognized there was just some things that was not right about that place. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you in a minute to maybe just kind of give me some things or give for us and those of you online uh, some things that you've seen in churches that you know is not right. All right? And there's a reason why I'm doing this. First Peter chapter 2, verse 4, are you there? Say amen. That was the lousiest day. I've had heard better amens at a Presbyterian church, all right? Are you there? Say amen. amen. All right. I know there ain't many of us tonight, but we can sound loud. Amen. To whom coming? As unto a living stone. That's Jesus. That is the opposite of worshiping a dead stone idol. With hands that cannot save, mouth that cannot speak, eyes that cannot see, ears that cannot hear. I'm glad I worship a stone that is alive, amen, as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious, ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house. And here's the question tonight. Who is building the house. Okay? And I, I'm asking that question in a general sense, but I'm going to ask you personally. Who is it that is building this church? Who is it that is building the house of your life for, for God to dwell in? Who is building your household? Your family. Who's building that? Who's in charge of that? Who's building, let's say, this community? Who's in charge of this community? Okay? So just kind of be thinking about that. Who should be building the house? So built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion. Now there's your clue right there. I lay in Zion, a chief cornerstone. Who is I in that verse? Who is that? That's God. That is God, the wise master builder. I lay in Zion, a chief cornerstone, elect, precious. And he that believeth on him 
shall not be confounded. Unto you, therefore, which believe, he is precious. But unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. That is not a capstone. And I've been searching. The NIV used to have capstone in this verse. And they since changed it and reverted back to cornerstone. And I don't know why they changed it, but I know they did. Okay? Because I got, I've got, I'm going to have to look up all, I've got two or three old NIVs. I'm going to pull them out and I'm going to check them again before I say this again. But I know they've changed it back because I've looked. Huh? Mandela effect. Either that or they were listening to Hoggard on YouTube and they went, oh man, he caught us. We better change that back before anybody notices. Anyway, he's not the cap, capstone is that all-seeing eye on top of that pyramid. That is not who Jesus is. He is the foundation cornerstone. When they lay the foundation of a house or a building, the very first, they don't start in the middle and work their way out. The very first stone that's put down is a true 90-degree cornerstone. Because when they set that down, the whole rest of the house is going to be based upon that. And if that 90 degrees is off by half a degree, that house is not going to sit right. You see, those stone cutters pre-cut all those stones. And they got it all measured out, got it all thought out. And if that cornerstone is off, when they go to set the rest of those stones, there's going to be a big hole somewhere. And that house is not going to stand. Amen? Wouldn't you rather have somebody who knows what they're doing build the house for you? Rather than, let's, let, I'm going to say it, rather than you doing it? Amen. Amen. I, in fact, I'm going to, you watch this now. Sterling, would you ever hire me to build a house for you? Tell the truth. Tell the truth. Just say no. You'd rather do it yourself. I heard him. Sterling told me, he said, I use this eye to level and this eye to plumb. And I've watched him do it too. He's pretty good at it. But anyway, unto you therefore which believe he is precious. Unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed. The same is made the head of the corner. And a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. Even to them which stumble at the word being disobedient. Whereunto also they were appointed. Now here's what I'm going to tell you. Since, since Peter is the one who attached it, I'm going to attach it. Number one, Christ is that headstone of the corner. He is. Number two, his Bible is the headstone of the corner. You cannot separate the two. When you lay Jesus down, you're laying the word down. You cannot, you cannot say, well, I believe in Jesus. I just don't believe everything in the Bible. You're a liar. Amen? You're a liar. Thank you, John, for that. Amen. Okay? They, and when they do, when they disallow Jesus, when they disallow the Bible, they're disallowing Jesus. Okay? And I'm going to ask you a question. Do you think God has ways in the Bible for churches to behave? Do you think God has ways in His Word for churches to evangelize? That should be an amen or a... Do you th I, I'm not asking you if you know all the verses. I'm asking you, do you believe that God has ways in His Word to evangelize? Do you think God has ways in this Bible for music to be done? In the church and in your life? You better believe it. Do you think God has ways in this Bible for you personally to live when nobody's watching you? Absolutely. See how easy that is? Okay? So if the Bible is not your headstone of the corner, you're going to be off. And that building is not sound and it will not last. Okay? You've heard me say, I've, I'll say it till I'm, God says I'm done preaching. If I preach it into you, 
Somebody else is going to come along and preach it out of you. If God puts it in you, it stays. Because it's a true foundation stone and it's not movable. It, you will not be confounded. Amen? Okay, that goes for you here and that goes for you people online. And I love the testimonies. I love what people say. But if I put it into you, somebody else can pull it back out. If God puts it in you, it's there to stay. And that's the difference. Okay? So, I'm going to ask you, I'm just going to go around and ask you. You've been to churches where you didn't feel like they were doing things right. What were some of those issues that you had? Who wants, go ahead, Alicia. Speak real loud. Mm -hmm. That makes a lot of sense. Chicago. Okay. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. It takes a village. Uh-huh. Putting on a show, right? Yeah. Listen, when we were in Megory, the last night, me and Mike Hutzel and Mick and Brent Hutzel was in Megory, Kenya. There was a church that we could hear out through our window. We had our windows open because it didn't have any air conditioning. And there was a church that sang that song all night long. One phrase, over and over, and they did it all night long. It was, we were so aggravated because we couldn't sleep. The same thing over and over again. They think by their much speaking that, that God will hear them. Okay? But Jesus told us specifically, don't do that. All right, I appreciate that. And, and I know what you're talking about. Go to church want, with one attitude, walk in the door with a completely different one. Oh, praise Jesus. It's a show. All right, who's got something else? Go ahead, Melissa. Someone right about it. Somebody else. Anybody? Anybody? All right, take a look up on the screen. And Psalm 127, if you want to turn there and mark this verse, this is an outstanding verse to put on the refrigerator, put on your bumper, to uh, 
as use as frontlets between thine eyes and, and write it on your hand. That's Deuteronomy chapter 6, by the way. Psalm 127, verse 1. Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Ask yourself the question, what happened to the tower at Babel? It is gone. It does not exist. Why? It was man's building and not God's. It was man's attempt to reach heaven with his own work, with his own hands. And I want to tell you, there is a valuable lesson to be learned in that. See, when you do not do it God's way, you have to use your imagination to come up with some other way. And that's what they did in Genesis 11. Because God specifically said, we've got to confuse their language, or now nothing that they imagine will be restrained from them. Whatever they imagine, they'll be able to do. And that's exactly what they were doing. They had come up with this plan of how they were going to reach heaven. And they were going to build this tower whose top would reach into heaven. That was their way of attaining heaven. And God shut it down. Because God, God already had a way. It was by a stone that Jacob set up. And he had a dream. And I got this scripture coming up. I don't know if I'll get to it tonight. But you remember that stone. Remember the stone is Jesus. And Jacob set up a stone for a pillar. And he had a dream that night. And he saw something. That was reaching from earth to heaven. What was it? It was a ladder. And there's something about that ladder that, you know, we, that's in the scripture. But anyway, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. I have experienced that, will experience it again. I cannot tell you that from here on out, everything that happens in my life is going to be up to God. I don't know that. Because I know how, how, I, know how I am. I still have a will. I still have a wicked, deceitful heart. There's things that I want to try, things that I want to do, things that I want to gain. And it may not be God's will. It may not be God's idea. And God will allow me to stumble, to fall... Because I refused to use the chief cornerstone and tried to do it my way. I tell you, I am full of that and so are you. Everything that you try on your own, I promise you will fail. Now if God loves you, He'll stop you before you get started. If God really loves you, He'll let you get started before He stops you. Because He'll show you, I'm telling you, it, you, know how, you know how our kids are, right? How we were when kids. Mom and dad tell us, now don't do that. Now don't do that. Now, and what did we do? We do it. And what would happen? We realize that we are as stupid as our mom and dad thinks we are. Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. Amen? Matthew's back there, and I don't mind announcing this. We have people that watch security cameras. Every service. All the doors are covered. We've got 16 millimeter guns. No, we don't have that. Okay? But did you know that if God did not protect this place, somebody could get in no matter what? Matthew could look at his Bible or something like that and miss some little creep creeping in the door. Okay? So this, this Bible's right, except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh, but in vain. So now, over I've got a comparison here. Over on the left, this is how man builds a church. And I know this because I tried or was going to try every one of these things. Number one, he will use the fading winds of public opinion. Rick Warren went out and did a survey in Orange County, California, of what it would take to get everybody in his community into his church. When he got the answers, he did exactly that, and he filled up five campuses. And then he wrote books. And then he got popular all over the world. They sell his books in Kenya. And they follow his model out in Kenya. Because he decided to go with the fads and the fading winds of human senses. 
In other words, find out how people are today and then do that. But I guarantee you in two years' time, you're going to have to change that because people are, fads go away. Whatever, whatever popular songs they played. See, I realized uh, this week that I, I'm stuck in the 80s and part of the 90s as far as the gospel music I listen to. And my family will tell you. I'm listening. I don't realize it, but I'm listening to music that's at least 30 years old. Okay? It's true, isn't it? I'm stuck back there. So if I thought that I could try to use music to build this church, I'd have to get, get up 30 years to find out what's being listened to now in order to get there. And I don't know that I can do it. I won't. I'm just saying. Churches are always on a constant rollover looking for what is the fad of today. And they try to satisfy that. They try to draw people in using movie titles, using music titles, using the fads and how people dress, and on and on. And what works today will not work six months from now, I guarantee you. That's how man does it. Number two, man will use worldly music. And is there a difference? I'm going to ask you, is there a difference? Between godly music and worldly music, is there a difference? You couldn't tell me the difference, but if you heard it, you'd know it. Amen? And I'm talking about those people who are right with God. Now, I do know that different people like different kinds of music. And the music, and you was talking about music a while ago, Alicia. In the two places we ministered out in Kenya a couple years ago, the first church we went to, we saw their version of godly worship. And I mean, it was a lot different than we do it here, but we could sense in the spirit of the people that they were worshiping God. Amen. They were having fun doing it, but they were worshiping God. Then we get out to Megori, and there's a young man out there, and I saw God move in his life. The first service we had out there, this guy went nuts. He was putting on the biggest dog and pony show you have ever seen in your life. And me and my cousin and Brent, we're just sitting there going, And I don't remember who it was that was preaching, but that day, God broke that man's heart, and he was just bawling his eyes out. And you know what happened? And Mike, the next day, Mike Hutzel preached on godly worship. And I mean nailed it down and got specific with it, so it was real obvious that he was preaching about what was going on. And did you know that young man started changing? And how he was leading the worship all of a sudden was more centered upon God than it was him. We could see the difference. Still and yet, it was far different than how we do it here. But we could see that they were worshiping God in it. So I know that there's differences in people. I get that. Okay? But I'm telling you, you can go just about anywhere and you can tell the difference when people's worshiping God and when they're just putting on a show. But man will always use worldly music. What was the name of that song I couldn't remember the other day? Money, Money Talks by ACDC. And from what I could get from the lyrics, is about a whore. It was about a harlot and Money Talks. And they were playing that, Sterling, in a church, what they called a church. A wicked, immoral, hard, heavy metal, rock and roll song in the church service. Okay? Uh, my mom said she heard in a church she visited down there one time, they were playing, um, I can see clearly now the rain is gone. They were playing that like it's warm-up music for everybody coming in. And she's going, that's not in the hymn books. Mom, I'm telling you, that's what they're doing. Number three. Here's how man will build a church. He will build it by administering self-help techniques. In other words, the messages and the teaching is going to be directed at what you have to do or what you must do or what you can do in contrast to the opposite, which is, I can do nothing except rely upon the cross. Self-help techniques. Number four, emphasis 
on good deeds or emphasis on the outward manifestation or the outward show. It's like you said. I know who you're talking about, Alicia. One spirit going to the church, another spirit in the church. Why was it that way? It's the show. It's all about putting on the show. It's all about where the lights are directed and who's on the stage. And it doesn't matter. Every service, it seems like those people are so spiritual. That, that makes you think that those people are spiritual like that 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. And boy, they have really got it together and poor you. Well, if you were just like them, you'd have it together like these people up here. And it's, all, it's emphasis on the outward manifestation. And I don't care if it's a Roman Catholic uh, mass where the choir is all in tune and they have loads of instruments playing all that mass music and all that stuff and there's glitter and gold everywhere. Or if it's a Pentecostal or a charismatic uh, dance or whatever it is, whatever it is, it's all about an outward manifestation. Number five, emphasis on quantity. How many people did we have? Coming in. How many services can we have? We have why we had we had to go to two services, did you know? That? We had so many coming. We went to two services. Oh, we went to three. And then we're building another campus. So we got this church going on here, and we put on, we built a whole other campus 20 miles south of here, and boy, we're filling that place up. And it is all about how many people we can get to walk in the door. Membership, baptism. Churches, Baptist churches, who ought to know better, because we don't believe that baptism saves anybody, and yet they make a big deal about how many they had baptized last week. We baptized 2,500 people last week. And they'd be sure you know that, et cetera, et cetera. Emphasis on quantity. Emphasis on the building. Emphasis on the building. I don't know about y'all, I like this place. I know where all the nooks and crannies and... I know, where, I know which toilets work and which don't. Amen. See, I know all that stuff. I, I would hate to lose this building. You know, for what we're doing now, we made it work. Okay? Took a little work, but we made it work. But it's the emphasis on... And, and the building basically is... A church is a woman. And in this case, the woman dresses in the attire of a harlot because she wants people as they drive by to use their senses and say that looks like a good church to go to right this is why you had to walk through the coffee bar to get to the sanctuary this is why you had to walk through the bookstore and see all the nice posters and all that nice glitter and stuff like that well if you come to Bethel you got to walk by Sterling and Joel, amen. <laughs> this is how God builds a church. Number one, he's going to build it upon the solid rock of the Word of God that never changes. Doesn't matter if people, well, we don't use King James because people can't read it anymore. Yeah, they can. That's just an excuse. That's an excuse. There's nothing wrong with how this Bible's written. Okay? The Bible, God, and His doctrine does not change just because the fads do. See, if you constantly are going to follow the people, you're going to be chasing them down the street. Always chasing them down, trying to get them to come to your church. You're like that kid in school who was always wanting you to be their friend. Will you be my friend this week? I was that kid, okay? Number two, they will sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Songs that have gone through the test of time. Songs that are 100% biblically based. If not, scripture themselves. Number three, instead of self-help technology, and I'm just... Let me go back to this music thing. Anybody who says, it doesn't matter what kind of music you do, anybody who says that, obviously, is leaning toward the worldly music. 
Because what they're, what they're saying is, and, and ask them, so why are you using Led Zeppelin music? Why are you playing Highway to Hell in your service? Why are you doing that? Well, that's the music that the people like. That's, you're, you're going after what the flesh wants. And see, salvation is a crucifixion of your flesh. It is not an accentuation of your flesh. It is not fulfilling the desires of the flesh. Give them psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. No matter what language, no matter what instruments are played, give them godly music. Jesus sings. Did you know that? Jesus sings. Oh, I'd love to hear Jesus sing. Okay? But I promise you, it's just like me going over and laying my elbow on the piano and playing that way or using my fingers deliberately to play songs in harmony with one another. When you are singing these songs, you will know that you're in tune with God's Spirit. That's what I believe. Number three, we will not preach self-help techniques. You preach the cross. Does your life need fixed? Yes. Go to the cross. Because by His stripes, we are healed. Is your house in order? And if it's not, take it to the cross where Jesus died to fix people's houses. Amen? See, it's, it's about what God does and not what you do. It's never about what you do. You didn't get saved because of what you did. You got saved because of what Jesus did. And it's always going to be that way. Doesn't matter if it's salvation. Doesn't matter if it's marital issues. It doesn't matter if it's financial issues. It doesn't matter. If you let God do it, He'll do it better than you can anyway. Number four. Emphasis on the inward man, not the outward man. The outer man, the Bible says, perishes and is perishing daily. The Bible says the inward man is renewed day by day. What do you think God is interested in? The outward man or the inward man? The outward man's going to die. You just mark it down. That, your, your face and your ugly body is dead already. Sometimes it smells that way first thing in the morning, doesn't it, Wayne? Amen? Amen. Emphasis on the inward man. What is God... Do? Ladies... What is God doing in you on the inside of you? What is God doing? What is God doing in your life? Is God telling you to dress in a certain way so you can attract men? Or so you can attract, you can stand out here and, and show your legs and, and bring people in? Look at here, look what we do in this church. Come on now, come on in here. And I had a guy, you know who it is, the guy that put in our sewer system. He's telling me, he said, I go to a church and he said, Pastor, I'm telling you. He said, the way some of our women are dressing when they come in that church, he said, it, it's not right. It is not right. And he went to a Pentecostal type church that follows, uh, have people follow Joyce Meyer in there. And he said, the way the women in my church dress, he said, I'm plump embarrassed half the time to go to church and bring my kids in there. That ought never be said about a church. Amen. See, the emphasis is on the inward man. And what God is going to do inside of you, not the outward show. Amen? Emphasis, uh, what is this, number one, two, three, four, five. Emphasis on bearing the fruit of the Spirit. Look how many people's in here. There's not many. Maybe not, so many on, not as many on Wednesday night on, on the online group as there is on Sunday morning. And... I'll be honest with you, sometimes I say, boy, I wish there's more people here. And I pray about it, I ask God about it, and I just let God do what God's going to do. The fruit that I'm interested in, as your pastor, is not so much how many is in this building. The fruit that I'm interested in is the fruit of the Holy Spirit in, from Galatians chapter 5 that God is manifesting in your life, in your marriage, in your home, in your not, your, not so much your church life, although I am interested in that, but your private life. Is God doing in you privately? Is God manifesting to you privately where nobody sees the fruit of the Holy Spirit? 
That's what I'm interested in. Okay? Because ultimately, you're not going to go to heaven or hell based upon what everybody else sees. You are going to heaven or hell based upon what God sees. When you're all alone and there's nobody around. See, that's the difference. If all we care about is the outward manifestation, and I'm not saying don't care about that. Yeah, I want people to feel like when they come in here that we treat them well. I want us to do as best a job as we can while we're singing. I want to do as best a job as I can while I'm preaching. But I know sometimes I'm going to make mistakes on the piano. I'm going to sing verse 4 eight times. Not on purpose. Now I'm going to use my elbow to play, sounds like. Alicia's going to use her foot to play sometimes, sounds like. We're not going to hit every note right. We're not going to sing all the notes right. We're not going to do everything right. Sometimes I just don't feel good while I'm preaching. And I don't try to pretend that I do. But what I'm concerned about is, is God manifesting fruit in your life? Because Jesus said in John 15, is that when God is pleased, when we bear much fruit. God is the husbandman of this vine. And God, I'm going to let God do in your life what God wants to do in your life. And then number six, emphasis on the character of the church, not necessarily the building of the church. That's what I'm concerned with. That's how God builds a church. He builds it in the character of the lives of the people who are going to that church. And there again, that falls back to the fruits of the Spirit. Do you have joy? And I'm not talking about the false, fake joy. Do you have real joy on the inside of you? Do you have love? Do you have faith? Do you have, I can't remember what's the other nine fruits of the Spirit. Do you have the manifestation of the fruits? Because those will consume and take over your character. Instead of you being somebody that nobody wants to be around, because of the fruits of the Spirit, which there's no law against, nobody hates seeing the fruit of the Spirit come out in a person's life. If you're somebody's neighbor, I guarantee... In fact, let's go to Galatians very quickly, and I'm going to turn you loose. Galatians, I, since I can't remember these, you think as long as I've been preaching, I would have spent time memorizing the nine fruits of the Spirit. Galatians chapter 5. Verse 22, the fruit of the Spirit is love. Let me ask you a question. Do, does your neighbor know that you love them? That's what we'll ask. Does your next door neighbor or the, the, the neighbor at work... <laughs> hey, that's pretty good. Does your neighbor know that you love them? Does your neighbor, two doors down from you, see a real joy in your life? Or do they see you kicking the car every time you walk out mad? Does your neighbor know that inside of you there is an inner peace about you that you keep it cool when everybody else would have blowed up? Does your neighbor, does your family members see long-suffering in you? Do they see in you that there's just something about you that I don't know how you put up with this all this time. I would have, I would have shot them already. Does your neighbor see that about you? Does your neighbor see a gentleness about you when you take the trash out? When you're walking the dog? When you're dealing with your kids? Does your neighbor see a goodness about you when you picked up your neighbor's trash can when it fell over? When you mowed part of their grass because they couldn't get to it that week? Does your neighbor see faith in you? You know how they'll see faith? They'll see faith by faithfulness. Faithfulness. Or are you these, yeah, we go to church, and they've counted how many Sundays your car has never left the driveway. Does your neighbors, does your family members, does your co-workers see meekness in you? Or are you constantly going on about the boss? That stupid idiot. I, listen, if I had his job, I'd do it a lot different. That's not meekness. Can I tell you, I'm just preaching on this thing on the cross, how God builds your life. If you've got problems at work, who better to take care of it? 
Temperance. You know what that means? You have an inner strength because you've been through the fires already. When, when they say he has a temper, they're not saying it right. When they say he has a bad temper, that means that he has not been tried and trued and strengthened and he loses it every time some little thing happens. When you have a temperament about you, you have been tempered and it takes a lot to push your buttons. That's the ninth one there. Against such there is no law. Did you, did, here's what I'm saying. Your neighbor will not ever have a problem with you manifesting these in your life. This is what God's church is concerned with in its people. Not this other stuff. Amen? If we will, as a church, allow God to build this place. I can't do it. I've been here 20 one years now, and I'm telling you, I do not, I have not ever learned personally how to build a church. I've tried this, I've tried that, I've done everything that I can think of. And God has let every one of them fail. Every one of them. I just said, God, I'll let you do it. I don't care what you do as long as you do it. Okay? And so far, I think God's done a pretty good job. Is, does that mean that we don't have to worry about what God does next? No, I think we always ought to be asking God, God, is there anything else you need for us to do? Is there anything else you want to do through us? God, you show us what to do and we'll do it. And I'll just say this to Bethel Church. If you're not satisfied with something in this church that you think is my responsibility, tell God. I would love for you to tell God. Because I am interested in what God does in this place. I am. You do not want me taking charge. I promise you. Okay? Because my family will tell you that everything I put my hands on is broken. Or doesn't work. Amen? But I got a feeling that's you too. I got a feeling that down deep inside when it comes to the real issues of life you're a fumbling idiot like I am and it's just better to let God do it amen now just as we stand up or I'll preach to you all night as we stand up see this deal about God building the house I want to ask you a question is there something in your life that is the product of everything that you are and things that you've done and you want it gone or you want it different and you cannot do it and you think God can do a better job of it, raise your hand. Should be everybody here. It should be everybody here. You're on it. Okay? I guarantee you there is. Ask God. Let God. See how simple that is? Ask him and let him. And he'll do it. I promise you he will. Okay? Who wants, who wants to lead us in prayer tonight? Anybody? Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you for grace. We thank you for mercy. We thank you, God, for your manifestation in our life. Father, if there's anything that you've shown Mike Hoggard, that he is incapable. I am nowhere near God, and you know this. I'm nowhere near where I was when I was in Bible college. I'm nowhere near where I was before I took my first church. I am nowhere near where I was when I first came here. And God, that's your doing. That's not mine, because I had it all different. And I messed it all up. Father, I'm thanking you, God, for not tossing me away. But, Father, for molding me and making me more in your image. And, Father, I believe, and down deep in my heart, that I still have a long way to go. So, Father, I pray, dear God, that you would establish the chief cornerstone in my life 
in my work, in my ministry, in my parenting, in my character, everything that is me, establish the chief cornerstone and then you build the house of what Mike Hoggard needs to be. And Father, if you'll do that in me, then I'll be content to let you do that in everybody else that I know. So Father, Lord, help your people tonight. Build the house. Show us, God, all the places we went wrong and that all of our best efforts won't work. We'll stand back and let you do it. That way, it is your house. It is your way. It is your vine. It is your kingdom. Lord, you do it. Everything you tell us in this book, God tells us that you're better at doing everything than we are. So God, show us your ways and build our house. We pray this in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, amen. God bless you. You're dismissed.